Tonight, the biggest hack in the history of the internet. We go beyond the self-driving car hype, and it's the National Day of Unplugging. But can it just be the National Day of Hugging? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 289 for Friday, March 6, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash tn 2 that's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the top story. This afternoon, the Department of Justice revealed that they have charged three men with what they're calling the largest data breach of names and email addresses in the history of the Internet. The report on the DOG uh, website says that the criminals were charged and pled guilty to hacking email hosting firms, stealing over one billion email addresses, and then using the business's data to run a spam operation. The Register's Ian Thompson reported on the story and he's here to talk to us about it and a few other stories. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Megan. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So when did this scam actually happen? Well, the initial hack took place in 2009, uh, according to the indictment, which was unsealed today. Um, but then they ran the operation for two years. Um, initially, they stole about a billion email addresses. And then it appears at this stage that they used the email companies they'd hacked to send out over a bit, you know, all the spam messages on a very regular basis using their own servers, which rather adds insult to injury. And it was only picked up about two years later, which doesn't say an awful lot for the security systems of the email firms involved. No, it doesn't. How did they find out about it? Um, the indictment doesn't go. It doesn't go into that level of detail. What we're what we're now going to see is the trial coming up in the next couple of months. Um, it does seem at the moment that it was uh, it was a fairly widespread operation. It's mentioned that it made at least two million dollars out of it, um, and so it's at the moment there's going to be a, a full investigation. Is my understanding, and I understand that also a congressional investigation may be looking into it as a critical infrastructure hack. So we don't know the companies that were involved either yet? They haven't been named, no. Um, there's a lot of speculation about, and it would be terribly wrong to comment on speculation, but it appears at least one of the firms involved was a very large text and email oper operation who we shouldn't really name. But um, as many as eight email providers were involved in this. So it's going to be very interesting to see who got caught and who didn't pick up on this in, you know, in enough time to really limit it. I mean, two years is a very, very long time to have someone running rampant through your servers. It is. I mean, yeah, you think about the spam, and it's like everybody gets spam. And, you know, it's just a fact of life. It's We have the other things to worry about. But that is amazing that it was two years that they were using their servers. So... Yeah. Are the, are the well, people... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, it, it's... I'm sorry, if they've been using their, these people's servers surreptitiously for two years, I would get the chief security and the officer, and he would have to, or he or she would have to offer some pretty good justifications for keeping their job because you should have intrusion detection systems in place to deal with this you should it should have been easily obvious from network traffic that something was going on so yes some fairly serious questions to answer so the uh the spammers are they all in custody now uh, they have two people in well one of uh, one of the people who hacked the network a Vietnamese gentleman uh, is in custody and has pled guilty uh, the Canadian firm where they laundered the the spam profits through he also has been arrested and uh, is under and will be facing trial but the third suspect the guy who actually did the hacking another Vietnamese national is currently on the run and we don't know where he is at the moment so any idea of the punishment they'll have to have? Will they have to go through my spam and read it all or something like that? <laughs> it would be rather nice, wouldn't it? Um, no, I mean, in sentences like this, generally the judge will hand down about two to ten years if they're found guilty. Uh, if the guy pled guilty and then um, went rashed out on his colleagues, he may get um, some kind of uh, sort of slightly reduced sentence for that. But the courts really are cracking down on this sort of stuff. It's becoming... Now, there was a period about 10 years ago when courts really didn't know what they were doing on this. Um, then there was a massive overreaction, and now we've just about got it right. So it'll depend on the vagaries of the case, but probably two to five years, maybe 10. 
Interesting. Well, let's move on to a few more lighter topics. Today, you also wrote about the AMD Liquid VR technology that's designed to make virtual reality less vomit-inducing. What can you tell us about <laughs> that? Um, well, basically, AMD is getting quite early into the VR game. Um, obviously, there's companies like Oculus that are driving the entire market. But for AMD, which uh, it, it's really important they get a, get get some skin in this, because their process, their, the big selling point of their processes over the competition is that they've integrated AMD uh, integrated graphics into there. They're much more graphically aware when it comes to their processes, and so they've released this uh, software development kit just to try and get really the march on the competition and make sure that AMD is the preferred preferred provider for graphics chips for this sort of thing. Um, so on the whole, looks pretty good. Um, they are strong in certain areas. They're doing a lot of nice little hooks that developers can can work on, and they get the frames per second rate, because it, it does appear from what we're seeing that unless you're running at about 90 frames per second, you are going to get motion sickness with a with a VR headset. So is that the same as the augmented reality, the HoloLens, and other things we've heard about that are augmented reality? Is the frame rate is still a problem? Um, frame rate's not such an issue on augmented reality because you've really only got a small viewing area in the center of the screen and you can still see the, your outside surroundings around that. So that gives the brain something to latch onto to know that it is dealing with a real situation. With a VR headset, you are totally enclosed, totally involved, and therefore frame rate is much more important. Right. So I know a lot of people, especially from Mobile World Congress, have been calling this the, the year of VR. Uh, do you agree or are we still going to have to wait to really to really see these in the no, world? No, no. 2000, 2015 will not be the year of VR. 2016 will probably not be the year of VR. And I'm betting on 2017 or 18 before you and I can go down to the shops, buy a decent, low, reasonably priced virtual reality headset and have the software to run on it. And it's been quite interesting going around the Game Developers Conference to see what kind of games are getting into this. Um, you know, it's all very well selling someone a VR headset, but if you're doing, say, first-person shooters where you're going to be wanting to run around, then the actual technology to enable you to do that with a VR headset on is massively expensive and still experimental. So I think we're going to see this initially in things like driving games, um, space piloting games, that sort of thing. But really, 2015 will not be the year of virtual reality, and 2016 is really pushing it. You hear, heard it here first. So you came on about, I guess it was about a month ago to talk about HoloLens uh, right after you had used it. Do you think that, that, that that's going to be in two years or do you think that's even longer to wait? Um, I was very excited about HoloLens as I think the interview, interview showed and I've calmed down a bit about it now. Um, <laughs> I think it's really promising, but HoloLens is probably even behind, well, certainly behind Oculus in terms of getting a, a finished product out there. The big differentiator, of course, is that Microsoft has enormous amounts of cash that it can throw at this. But now that Facebook has taken over Oculus, they, they also have a bigger budget to play with. I would guesstimate that you're not going to see commercial HoloLens products out for a couple of years. Um, they did have the flashy back headband, you know, the flashy headband display that they use in presentations, but those aren't functioning bits of kit as far, you know, for practical use as far as I can see. And given the amount of space they've got in there, the lack of venting for processors, and uh, the no, there's no space for battery, I think those are really display units that you can use for a couple of minutes at a time, and a commercial product is a fair way away. Right. Well, what do you make of Magic Leap? That's the, the company that Google invests in that almost no one's really seen what they have to offer. Uh, the, the CEO was in the news a few weeks ago. He said that he thought that virtual reality, as opposed to what he's doing, would, might cause brain damage. Uh, what do you think about this company and that, that accusation about brain damage? Well, on the brain damage thing, I think he's talking out of his backside, to be quite frank. Um, it's just we haven't seen anything from Magic Leap on their technology. There's a couple of flashy videos on their site. He obviously hasn't been in Microsoft's headquarters working on HoloLens. So how he can opine that this is going to cause brain damage strikes me as, quite frankly, just rubbish. Um, we, I mean, we really don't know with Magic Leap because we, they're not talking about the technology. And the Reddit AMA that he made that comment on, he did receive an awful lot of criticism for not giving any kind of detail about how it actually worked. It was basically just, oh, it'll, it'll be great, it'll blow you away. And, you know, we've heard this kind of thing so often in the technology industry. Um, it, it, I just, it's, it's good PR for him, I'm sure, but if he's going to raise expectations and fear monger at that sort of level, it doesn't really bode well for the rest of the company. 
right. So now you had a third story online today about a new McKinsey report that says that self-driving cars will save billions of man hours a year. You also point out that that means that while our cars are driving themselves, we'll just be working more instead of driving our cars and listening to podcasts. Uh, what do you make of this McKinsey report? Um, well, it was interesting. I mean, it, it draws together some of the, um, the key things that we've seen uh, as being a, a good thing for self-driving cars in that, yes, they would allow you to get on with other things on, on the morning commute. That and that in terms of reducing the amount of time spent parking and the amount of parking spaces, all well and good. But they've missed out on a certain on a, a number of a number of other things. Firstly, it's the regulatory environment. Self-driving cars can only work at the moment if you've got someone in the seat ready to take over if the computer crashes. And under those circumstances, you're not going to be able to get much work done. So we're going to have to have a regulatory environment that says self-driving cars are safe enough so that people don't have to be concentrating on the road while they go. And of course, the downside of self-driving cars is the couple of million people in this country whose primary job is driving cars, buses, taxis, limousines. They're all going to be out of a job. So there's no indication from McKinsey as to how many people we're going to lose. But looking at the labor stats, that's a lot of people who are suddenly going to find technology has basically taken their job away. And there's no suggestion from anyone developing autonomous cars as to what that could be, what could be brought in to help employ those people. Right. And, and you didn't even mention the race car drivers. This morning we talked to Tim, Tim Stevens. He was uh, at the Geneva Auto Show and they had autonomous race cars. So, I mean, not that anyone needs to feel sorry for race car drivers losing their jobs. I'm sure they'll find other jobs, but it does seem to sort of take the fun out of it a little bit, I think. Well, I'm a huge Formula One fan, and I'm sorry, part of the fun of Formula One is seeing how different driver styles come through. And if they're going to take the drivers out of there, I think they're going to lose an awful lot of people because who honestly really wants to watch robot cars go around a track. It's the, the coupling of extreme engineering with the extreme effort it takes to do it for a human being that ma really makes most of the contest. Right. Well, as long as we're making predictions about VR, uh, when do you predict wide-scale adoption of autonomous vehicles? Will yeah. Ooh, okay. Well, McKinsey reckon widespread adoption by 2040. Um, Google is saying they're going to be in a position to get their cars on the road by about 2020 or 2023. I would probably go for about 2030 before we see a reliable... Car, autonomous car on the market, which w it will be at a roughly the same price as your standard commuting vehicles are today. And that may be optimistic because there's an awful lot of hardware to build into there. And Moore's Law is, you know, obviously keeping helping to drive things down. But at the same time, Moore's Law only really works for processes. You've got to get lasers in there. You've got to get radar in. You've got to get a whole equipment suite into the car at a cost which and you and I can afford. And at the moment, I don't see it happening. We'll see a certain amount of autonomous functions, for example. Tesla are talking very, very about this. And we've already got self-parking cars from Volkswagen and others. But in terms of a car where you can just get in, program your environment, and lean back and wait for it to drive to work, 2030, I think, is a, is a conservative uh, estimate. Okay. Uh, so you said you were at the Game Developers Conference this week. Did you see anything else worth mentioning? Um, there's a lot of, uh, I, I don't know, there's an awful lot of VR stuff and an awful lot of um, sort of uh, AR wannabes. Um, that's actually looking quite promising. Uh, the big thing is that how quickly the Chinese vendors are getting, you know, getting in this. I saw so many Chinese games vendors who got some really blow you away games. Uh, and also a bunch of other software on there to help at the back end of that. Uh, so that was quite interesting. Um, from a British perspective, there's uh, the, the Frontier Company, who behind Elite, one of the earliest computer games, have got a stunningly good new build of Elite Dangerous. Um, and there's also a lot of there's a lot of really very good sort of immersive games designed to be played on 4K 4K displays to that sort of really suck you in, and uh, actually being designed with the idea of trying to get people completely immersed in the game, which is a bad thing I think in terms of getting people weaning people off games addictions. But on the other hand, it makes for a stonkingly good light show. So yeah, as long as you're not addicted, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Ian, thank you so much. Ian Thompson writes for the Register, and you will be joining Leo on Twitter this Sunday, I hear. Indeed, indeed, always good, always good for a chin wag. Yeah, so you can see him there, and uh, you can also follow uh, Ian on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle again? Uh, just Ian Thompson. Um, slightly odd spelling, as you'll see below, but right. uh, I blame my parents for that. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Thank you.
Coming up, a shakeup at Samsung, and the Apple Watch battery might last longer than you think. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Lynda.com. Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn to be more assertive, build a website, boost your Photoshop skills. I recently learned that my 11-year-old daughter is better than I am at Photoshopping images, so I plan to take some Lynda.com courses this weekend to bone up. If you'd like to stay one step ahead of your children, Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind or theirs. Some of the courses I recommend are the Foundations of Programming Fundamentals, WordPress Essential Training, and Android Studio Essential Training, which is a great resource if you're looking to build an app. With a Lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule. You can also create course playlists to customize your learning path or share with friends, colleagues, and team members. Your Lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit Lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for a free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2, and we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Engadget reports that some of the biggest tech companies have come out in support of the business case for marriage equality. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and others have filed a court brief to convince the Supreme Court to support nationwide marriage equality. The brief says that the current confusing legal standing on same-sex marriage makes it increasingly difficult to conduct business. In addition to making it easier to administer insurance plans, businesses say that blanket support of gay marriage would prevent employees from leaving and moving to states that recognize their marriage. CNET reports that Samsung marketing chief Todd Pendleton, the man behind the next big thing campaign you might remember for the Galaxy S3, he says that he'll be leaving the company in early April. Several executives have left the Plague smartphone company recently, and it's fair to say they haven't had the best news week with reports that their brand new flagship phone, the Galaxy S6, might have a hardware problem. And in the Apple Watch numbers game, Mark Gurman from 9to5Mac says his sources tell him the watch battery will, ha will last for five hours with fairly heavy use, and that it will take four to five hours to charge from zero to 100%. So a few days ago, we were hoping it would charge while we showered. That does not look to be accurate unless you take a really long shower. And if you're in California, you should not. And finally, how's the National Day of Unplugging going for you? It's today. It's not going so good for me so far. <laughs> to be fair, the National Day of Unplugging, where you unplug all your devices, it officially starts at sundown today, March 6th. And the sun has yet to set in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I could still do it. And when the sun does set, I don't know if I can do it. Can you email and let me know if you participated in the National Day of Unplugging? Email me after the day is over. If you participated, email me during the day. If you're not participating, let me know why. My email address is megan at twit.tv. And if you want to learn more, go to nationaldayofunplugging.com. Before the sun sets, if you have no idea what to do without your devices, they will tell you. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. It's usually at 10 a.m. Pacific, but on Monday morning it will be at 9 a.m. Pacific. And 10 a.m. we will be streaming the Apple Spring Forward event live at live.twit.tv. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.